How fast were the old mainframe languages like COBOL and FORTRAN if they were actually run on today's best hardware? They were small and fast, but how would they compare to today's C and C++ compilers? Well, bust out your bell bottoms and punch cards, because today we're going completely retro. We're going to take our classic C++ prime save and port it to FORTRAN and COBOL in order to see how those classical languages compare for performance. We'll run your grandpa's languages on my new Threadripper to see if even carefully written FORTRAN can approach the speeds of modern C++. And which is faster, COBOL for business or FORTRAN for science? We'll find out today. If you had a bike with a banana seat or a $6 million man action figure, then like me, you were just a kid when these ancient languages were state of the art. Join me today as we tour the code and drag race the results live as we work towards finding out authoritatively what the fastest computer language of all time is. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to look at the grand old dames of the 1970s, Fortran and COBOL. Now, I don't want to make any really bold claims on my little show here, but uh, God is real and I can prove it. How? Well, he's undeclared, and in Fortran, all undeclared variables whose names begin with the letters I through N are implied to be integers, and the rest are deemed as real or otherwise. Thus, God, beginning with G, is by international definition and ISO standard real. If you call yourself a programmer and you don't know that old joke, well, you better stay tuned because you're in for a bit of a historical roller coaster as we explore these titans of the disco era. In fact, these languages are actually a bit older than the 1970s. Fortran goes back to 1954, believe it or not, and COBOL came along just a few years later in 1959. But I'd say the golden age of these languages was the 1970s when Fortran and COBOL dominated the data centers. Mainframes like the IBM System 360 and minis like the PDP-11 were serving power bills and computing insurance actuarials around the clock back then. The name Fortran comes from formula translation, and the language was primarily intended as a way of giving engineers and scientists the means by which they could express their domain problems in a higher level language than assembly language, which was really the primary alternative back in those days. If you weren't working in Fortran, odds are you were working in COBOL. COBOL stands for Common Business Oriented Language. Nowadays, it seems you can't talk about COBOL without hearing about Admiral Grace Hopper. If you type the question, who invented COBOL into Google, you are proudly given the answer, Grace Hopper. Now, that's a popular urban legend, but Admiral Hopper did a little more than provide some general guidance to the project. According to Wikipedia, she, quote, did not participate in its work except through the general guidance that she gave to her staff, who were then direct committee members. Thus, while her indirect influence was very important, Regrettably, the frequent statements that Grace Hopper developed COBOL or Grace Hopper was a co-developer of COBOL or Grace Hopper is the mother of COBOL are just not correct, end quote. She also did not coin the phrase bug when she pulled a moth out of a relay or vacuum tube. That one's just plain made up. Now, if I've stolen one of your female programming heroes, I'm sorry about that. So I'm happy to loan you one of my own, though, like Margaret Hamilton, who quietly landed men on the moon and returned them safely to the Earth with her code. You don't need to embellish an Ada Lovelace when you've got a real Laura Butler on your hands. I've never actually coded in either Fortran or COBOL myself, at least not beyond the most basic introductory level assignments back in school. That means that touring the code will be as much of an education for me as it is for you. The name COBOL was selected by the design committee back in 1959, and the first compilers came online in 1960. If you're wondering if COBOL is still relevant at all, Current enthusiastic estimates put the total amount invested in active COBOL systems around the world at $2 trillion, and believe it or not, programmers actively contribute about 5 billion lines of new COBOL every year, comprising about 15% of all new code that's written annually. That's because more than 80%, yes, 80% of today's transactions are said to still be conducted by COBOL code, at least on the business side of things. It's estimated that about 70% of all mission-critical code around the world today is still in or contains some COBOL, and that about 2 million people around the world are still working with COBOL in one form or another. All that said, it's a terrible, terrible language. Now, if that sounds a little harsh, at least I'm not alone. Edgar Dykstra once said that COBOL cripples the mind and the teaching of it should be regarded as a criminal offense. How bad can it be? Well, let's take a look. At the top of a COBOL program can be found what is essentially a comment block describing the program, who wrote it, and what it's for. In our sample, we learn that the Primes program's name is Primes and that this solution was written by Frank Van Bakel for the project. Thanks for your contribution, Frank. Right below the header block, right up at the top of the program, we find the variable declarations. 
COMP stands for computational, and the variables are declared by providing a little picture or template of the variable format. For example, nine with seven in parentheses. The nine means a decimal digit, and the seven means that there are seven of them, so this can track up to 10 million using its seven digits. A V99 implies two decimal places, so if you have nine and then seven in parentheses, V99, you'd have a number from one to 10 million, followed by two decimal places. Next, we find the COBOL declaration for the prime array, which is a block of one-bit values repeated 500,000 times. Now, this algorithm isn't technically faithful to the original because it keeps a spare copy of the array with all the bits preset in memory. It does this because it's a lot faster than clearing out or presetting an entire array in COBOL, apparently, so they keep this pre-staged array to copy over each time. Is that cheating? Well, let the Fortran fans decide that one. Once we get into the logic of COBOL, you'll see how different the syntax really is. In designing the language, there was an attempt to make the code more readable by using English keywords in a sentence-like syntax, but whether that was ever successful in any meaningful way is hard to know. Were there really middle managers who were not programmers then able to read or browse COBOL code? I suppose that was part of the intent, but did they succeed? Moving a value is simple enough. You simply move the value to a variable. But calling a subroutine is a little different, as it is done with the perform keyword, which is rather powerful in COBOL with multiple uses. In this case, we tell it the starting point that we will begin at, as well as the last statement in the block. In the first example, we are calling get now, which will return the current time in the now hs variable. At first, the division looks reasonably self-explanatory, dividing two into max root. The trick with division in COBOL is that it can return a rounded quotient along with a fractional remainder, which actually turns out to be handy. Next, we find an if-then clause, which is remarkable only in that max root index is decremented by adding a negative value to it. Scanning down a little further, our next point of interest is the perform varying statement. That would be the closest to what we know of as the for statement today, perhaps. It takes a variable, starts it at one value, and then performs a step-by-step -step addition to it until it reaches the target value. This loop is used to clear the bits out of the prime array. It walks through the array, starting at start at and stepping by step size until Z reaches bit size. Console, or line printer output, is performed with the display keyword. It formats each line by following it with a new line, and we can see one line of code here that outputs a single space, clearly intended to generate a blank line of output. At the bottom of the file are three simple subroutines. One oddity in COBOL is the add statement, which allows up to three operands that are then summed together. The first version adds a one to an existing variable, in this case, prime count. The next version adds two copies of i plus one and saves the result in the prime variable. That should be enough to give you the general flavor and form of the COBOL language, so from there, we turn our attention to Fortran. Fortran used to be sexy. I mean, before it was a language that your grandpa used that had cool names like Fortran 77. Now, Fortran 77 sounds like the language Burt Reynolds would program in. He'd be hairy as a bastard somehow, but still smell good doing it. If Bruce Lee was going to pick a language that was the most formless so that the code could be like water and expand to fit the program it was contained in, it would absolutely be Fortran. Before I knew anything about Fortran, I assumed two things. That the syntax was terse and that, two, the answers were highly reliable. They could have launched the Apollo rocket on Fortran if they could have taken a mainframe in the capsule with them. I'll say this much. After looking at COBOL, Fortran was a much-needed reprieve. I'll be honest, COBOL feels weird and alien to me as though a, what character column a statement started in on the punch card was going to somehow affect the program's billing code. I never felt like I truly knew what was going on behind the scenes. But a few seconds into looking at the Fortran, I felt like I was at home. Not my own home, but a home in a simpler time, like it was Mayberry USA and all you had to do was declare a few variables, write a little code, and call some simple subroutines. The rest would take care of itself, and the sheriff would set things right. Right off the top, I bet this Fortran code makes some sense to you, even though it's pretty ancient looking. The program gives itself a title and declares which other modules it's dependent on. It also declares that there are no implicit variables. An implicit variable is a set of variables like scratch registers that are silently defined for your use so that you can use them without declaring them. This is also where that God is real bit comes into play. What do I mean by that? Well, Fortran has an interesting historic feature called implicit typing. Undeclared variables whose names begins with I, J, K, L, M, or N are implied to be integers, and everything else is real otherwise. It makes some sense in that I is then integer and R is real, but it's still half voodoo to me. And a variable named God is therefore real because it begins with a G. Basically, implicit typing in Fortran is a historical oddity that I recommend you need to be aware of, but that you not adopt as any kind of usage pattern. 
From Fortran 90 and on forward, you should be able to use the implicit none keywords to turn off the magic variables and make all declarations then explicit. We find the program's explicit declarations up at the top. Among them is the array of bits, which looks to be an array of bytes that will be managed as a big bit field. There's no equivalent of a main function. It appears that program flow just starts at the top of the file and flows on down, so the assignments to sieve size and pass count are made, and then the clock is started, and we enter the main run sieve loop. Each time run sieve is called, the pass count is incremented, and the time is checked to see if five seconds have elapsed yet. When they have, it falls out of the loop and into a call to print the results. The contains keyword indicates where the subroutines and functions begin. If you've ever wondered what the difference technically is between a function and a subroutine, it's of course that functions return a value of some kind and subroutines just execute and return. So in C, a void function is a subroutine. Let's jump all the way down to the core of it, the actual run sieve routine. After declaring its variables, it checks to see if the bit array has been allocated yet, and if so, it deallocates it to force it to start fresh. It then calls the routine to allocate the bit field and proceeds into the sieve logic. That sieve logic is the same classic algorithm we saw in my C++ and Python examples, and in Fortran, it's still quite readable. It searches for factors up to the square root of the limit, and then walks their multiple through the array, clearing out prime number candidates. One historical curiosity you'll see here is that Fortran doesn't use the conventional less than and greater than symbols, but rather uses .lt for less than and .gt for greater than. The constant values for true and false are also specified in that same fashion. If we jump up to the get bit and set bit functions, we see the heart of the code, where the real work happens. There are three Fortran functions used to make it work. The first of those is btest for testing an indicated bit. Next, ibclear is used to clear out an index bit and return a value with that bit pre-cleared. We also see frequent use of mod to obtain the modulus of a number, which, rather than being an operator as in C, is a system function that you call. Finally, let's look at print results so that we can see how the console output is handled. The command of interest to us is the write command. It appears that using an asterisk, almost as a stream operator, you can queue up output that you finally write out to the console by then sending it on to the air unit. The write command supports an impressive set of numeric output formatting codes. For example, I0 means integer without any leading digits. F0.3 means a floating point value with no leading digits and three places after the decimal point. It's not quite printf yet, but it's clearly a precursor to what it would become in future languages. All in all, I found the Fortran much easier to digest than the COBOL. I can't say I'd be eager to spend much time writing a lot of code in either, but if I had to, I'd much rather be working in Fortran than COBOL. But that's just me, and it's because the languages that I know and love, like C++ and C Sharp and so on, are derived more from the Fortran side of the language tree. What I think is one thing, but this is a language drag racing series, and that means it's time to race them. We'll put them head to head and let them both calculate the primes to one million as many times per second as they can. Grab a helmet and stand by as I get ready to launch the race. Each language will be tested by the stack, our tame racing driver. Some say he once returned from a function before even calling it, while others say he's the actual developer that Steve Ballmer was yelling about. All we know is that he's called the stack and he's about to test drive these two languages for me. this has been one of the closest races yet. I had a hunch that they'd be close, but not that close. With 1163 passes, Fortran ekes out a narrow win over COBOL with its 1118 passes. There's no such thing as a draw in these races, but I think for our purposes they're close enough so as to be about the same speed. For comparison, and the part that you're most likely interested in, they come in at about half the speed of my C++ effort that it comes in at 1936 passes. Contrary to what everybody seems to assume, neither C nor C++ nor even assembly language is the current leader. That leader is running at over 4,000 passes per second, more than twice my best effort in highly optimized C++. If you want to know what language it is, make sure you subscribe to the channel for the big reveal in the forthcoming High Speed episode, where I show you the top five fastest languages. Three of them I'd never even heard of before this series began, so I hope it'll be as fun and educational for you as it has been for me. Like I said, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. At the end of this video, I'll throw up a playlist for all the language racing episodes so you can check them out individually. It's been my most popular series to date, actually, and so I do hope you enjoy it. As always, 
Thanks to the folks like Rutger in the Netherlands and the rest of the GitHub team and all the collaborators and contributors that made this entire thing possible. If not for all their hard work, it never would have progressed beyond the initial three languages, and here we are at more than 70 languages. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Keep your eye out for the high-speed episode, and in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. <laughs>